The topics and opinions expressed in the following show are solely those of the hosts and their guests and not those of W4CY Radio, its employees, or affiliates. We make no recommendations or endorsements for radio show programs, services, or products mentioned on air or on our web. No liability, explicit or implied, shall be extended to W4CY Radio, its employees, or affiliates. Any questions or comments should be directed to those show hosts. Thank you for choosing W4CY Radio. Hey, welcome back, everyone, to the Geek Skeezers and Googleization Show, where we talk with HR and business thought leaders about all the crazy shift going on in the world of HR, recruitment, and business. I'm your host, Ira Wolf, and I'm joined again by my co-host, Keith Compagna, and our sponsors are Jobvite and Success Performance Solutions. We have a great show lined up today. Our topic is Workforce 2030, uh, and the subtitle is Masterminding Success in Your Organization. That coincidentally is this title of a summit sponsored next week by Lehigh Valley SHRM chapter. That's in uh, Lehigh Valley, Pennsylvania. Uh, we're especially grateful to have one of our keynote speakers as our guest today, Pandit Dasa. Uh, it <laughs> seems to me that his message, Keith, uh, mindful leadership, uh, a business imperative, that's the title of his presentation next week, couldn't come at a better time. Uh, just before the show, you and I were talking a little bit about IBM's um, study they released last week, where they revealed uh, 120 million workers from the world's 12 largest economies. That includes 11 and a half million workers from the U.S., about one-tenth of our workforce, a little less than one-tenth, may need to be retrained because of advances in artificial intelligence and in, uh, and intelligent automation within the next three years. Amazing and, statistics. I mean, and not, not that it's, it should surprise anyone, but. Right. And, and what blows my mind about it is what is the stat for the, like, I don't know, five years, right? My kids, my kids grow up so fast. Time flies by so fast anymore, Ira. I think five years could get here just as quickly as three years. You know, that's really funny you said that because in, in part of, um, I'm, I'm also presenting next week, um, again, about Workforce 2030, you know, um, how, do you, how do you work in a fast-changing uh, world? Um, and, you know, one of the statistics that I had was whatever you think is going to happen in Workforce 2030, think about what people project for 2050, because that's probably what the world will look like in 2030, where mm -hmm. people think we have 10 years and we're, we're basically on that linear scale as it used to be. When we live in an exponential world, things are changing so fast. Um, what people kind of figure in their minds, and <laughs> so so appropriate that we've got Pandit on today, talking oh, about it. mindfulness, about all, all the, uh, as he describes, all the apps going on in our heads. Uh, of, uh, you know, experiences of how fast things are changing. You're right. I mean, what what we think is going to happen in 10 years is probably going to happen in three. What we think the workforce is going to look like in 2030 um, is probably what most people envision in 2050 and go, you know, I'm not going to be around. I'm not gonna, I don't have to pay attention to that. And they better because, you know, when you're talking about 11 and a half million workers just in the next three years uh, need to be retrained. The scary part of it is is that less than half of the CEOs that were surveyed in, you know, by IBM that were included, and I think there were 2,200, uh, said that they don't have the resources needed to close none. the skill gaps. <laughs> none, none. I was just going to say, you know, who's going to teach this reskilling? There's so what what I see, what I absolutely love about uh, having Pandit on the show today and getting to be, you know, uh, you know, you're you're speaking at the event too, and and you always bring the heavy technology side. Um, but before we go to all of that and to discuss that, I, I think what we're witnessing is what you and I talked about almost a year ago, right, buddy? Like the rate of change, thank you, technology, is really messing with humans' inability to keep up with it. And, you know, you, you, it's easy for us to say, oh, yeah, three years from now, we're going to need to reskill. But humans aren't going to be able to do that because one that means one year from now you need people to reskill. And who's putting that together? We haven't even you know we're we're kind of tied into the HR world here, and I haven't heard anybody talk about how they offer a training for reskilling. 
Have you? <laughs> well, well, you know, it's it's funny. I just uh, I was interviewed a couple. It's probably a couple months ago now um, by um, for for an article, and he just contacted me yesterday, and he said, "Do you?" And maybe you you know this. I didn't reach out to you yet. Uh, of someone who's under thirty five or over fifty five that has actually gone through reskilling in the last few years. Yeah, I have a podcast with him. Oh, okay, uh, good. So we'll have to reach out. So anyway, he's looking to interview somebody for for that. Um, yeah. But the the fact is, is that it's not something that is off the top of our head. Right. I mean, it's 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 you know we we talk about it all the time, and we have all these examples and people going back to school and getting certificates and and yeah. learning. And you know, we've had a couple of people on with LMS systems. You know what e learning looks like, um, but it's it's not on a um, I don't want to say, you know, because there's a lot of people that are participating and it's certainly gotten a lot of attention, uh, but it's, it's certainly not keeping pace. Part of this, too, and I, I don't remember what the I'm trying to look it up here while while we were talking there. Um, one of the things also was that the oh, here it was it the time it takes to close the skills gap through employee training has grown more than 10 times in the last four years. Right. It takes 10 times longer to retrain somebody. So a, a, as as the time span for reskilling shortens, the right. time to reskill lengthens. And, and, and I want to actually, let's think about that, right? But I want to go back a step and, and almost self-correct here because when I say where the reskilling issue is is a real challenge, and that there isn't anyone doing it, I don't mean that. In, I mean that in the traditional sense. I mean, here I am with LifeWork Integration. Here's Pandit talking about uh, mindfulness. I believe that the very reskilling that needs to be done is an internal reskilling mm -hmm. before mm -hmm. it becomes external because you're, you have to let it play out. You know, you we're talking about the teachers – the students aren't going to be ready either. And in my mind, and again, this is just the crazy way I think about this stuff, technology is going really, really fast. We have to reprogram our technology, our in, in, you know, internal technology, so that we could better receive it. And mindfulness comes into play. I, I, I'm, I can't wait to have this conversation. Yeah. Because I think you know, for the people going to the, the event, there is going to be quite literally the yin and the yang of workforce 2030. And I think that there's so much more value anymore in the way that people internalize things like stress. And, uh, and I think that that'll give them that, that competitive advantage that they need. Uh, hopefully they can take it back to the office and use it. Yeah. Oh, and there, hey, there's no question. And I think that, you know, I think you hit it on the head. I mean, we, we talk about the employers and whose responsibility is it employers, a government, is it a school, is it the community? Um, but there is a responsibility that needs to be borne by the employees, the workers. Uh, for their own reskilling. And that's why it's so exciting. And, you know, I, I shared with you before, uh, you know, the topics not only about emotional intelligence, but mindfulness. Uh, you know, I heard a, another great speaker at the Convergence, the Cornerstone Convergence Conference just a few months ago. And, uh, you know, so I think employers are getting it, but I'm, I'm still not sure where the employees are. So what a what a timely topic. Um, so I do want to bring up Pandit on. Um, just kind of a quick overview. The event that we're talking about, by the way, for, you know, and I know we've, we've got uh, an international audience, so not everyone will be here. But uh, the event September 18th uh, at Steel Stacks, a great place. If you haven't been there, uh, you gotta you, you got to attend. We were just there the other night to, to see a movie. Um, but uh, it'll be at Steel Stacks in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania on September 8th. If you want information about it, uh, you can go to Sherm LV. That's S-H-R-M. LV for Lehigh Valley dot org, ShermLV dot org, and just click on the events and uh, you'll see Workforce 2030 pop up. And for, for all of our international listeners, the Lehigh Valley does host an international airport. So, you know, That's you're true. welcome to come. Yeah, yeah. and we're, we're only uh, an, hour out, an hour or so outside of uh, Newark and uh, pretty close to Philly. Sure so, enough. yeah, no, no excuse for you not being here. So, yeah. without further delay, I um, want to bring in uh, Pandit. Um, he has an extraordinary vision for Workforce 2030, uh, much different than the uh, dystopian view that, that many of us, including me, might paint for life just 10 years away. 
Uh, although I, I I try to balance it. I think there's a lot of hope, but there's, you know, but uh, I'm, I'm certainly fearful of some of the results as well. Um, just to give you an idea what, uh, you know, what Pandit's picture is, uh, he imagines a workforce where leaders and managers lead to inspire, support, and encourage. Um, there are no ego battles that are stifling the progress. We, we certainly see that a lot. Um, colleagues celebrate each other's success. And employees experience a positive social connection at work. Um, so, you know, that almost sounds idyllic. And, uh, and, and uh, Pandit and I both had, uh, as I said, uh, we talked, we, we emailed back and forth the other day, messaged, um, you know, part of our stories, our paths to get where we are, talking about Workforce 2030 are, are pretty ironic. So I guess it's, uh, you know, if, if a monk and a dentist walked into a bar you know, and, and we're going to solve all the problems of Workforce 2030. Uh, we'll, we'll hear all about that soon. Uh, so, Pandit, welcome to Geek Skeezers and Googleization. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. And, you know, just one point. Uh, I don't think me as a monk would walk into a bar. Maybe the two of us would walk into a meditation room and have that conversation. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, that's true. That's true. But it's probably as far-fetched as, uh, you know, having a monk and a dentist being uh, somewhat leaders and talking about Workforce 2030. Uh, just it definitely a few years is. Ago. Yeah. So you've had quite a journey. So let, let's hear about that. Uh, you know, you, um, you know, we, I, 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 both Keith and I were watching some of your videos and reading about your stories. So I, I thought I thought I had a everybody. It's, it's funny. You, they talk about how did you, be, you know, how did you become a monk and, and how did you leave being, not leave being a monk, but how did you change that lifestyle? And, and I get that question all the time. It's, wow, you became a dentist. Why did you choose that? And then it's, wow, you left dentistry. How did you choose that? Uh, so we've, uh, we've had parallel paths, but uh, I'll, I'll give you the, the up on it because I think yours uh, took a quite a turn and quite a journey. So let's hear about it. Well, um, yeah, so like you said, you know, that was the number one question that was, I was being asked is, you know, I'm walking around New York City wearing the robes of a monk uh, on the Lower East Side. And naturally, you know, people see you, they wonder, like, you know, what's going on here? What made you choose this very, you know, kind of out of the box lifestyle? It's not something uh, anybody thinks of becoming growing up. You know, people want to be like a, an athlete or an astronaut or a fighter fighter you know, a lawyer, doctor, something like that. Dennis, but yeah. I don't think anyone, yeah, <laughs> Dennis, maybe, you know, Dennis, doctor, you know. Um, but monk, you know, because generally all the other occupations involve making some kind of money and income. <laughs> <laughs> so For that's sure. where everybody's choosing something. No one's thinking that, you know, I want to live a life of simplicity, sacrifice, poverty, and humility uh, without a bank account. So it is. it was a definitely an unusual uh choice that I, I don't even want to say that I made that choice. I felt like life sort of like threw me in that direction and the choice. And then when I was face to face with it, it just seemed really attractive. So it's not like something I grew up meditating on and thinking about like, gosh, I'd really, when I get older and I have some freedom, I want to be a monk. You know, that's, that was a thought that absolutely never, ever, ever crossed my mind. Uh, so I want to make that clear. Um, nor did it happen that my parents dropped me off at a monastery like we may see in some movies or something at the age of five, <laughs> and then all of a sudden, you know, nothing like that. So the story is that, you know, uh, to keep it sort of uh, short, you know, I grew up in Southern California. My parents migrated from India to L.A. in 1980. I was only seven. They came over with almost nothing, so they were working seven days a week. They had a little gift shop on Venice Beach on the boardwalk there, um, and they were working seven days a week, just selling gift items and hair. And I was just kind of running around Venice beach, exploring America, <laughs> um, at the age of seven. And, uh, but within about an eight year period, they, uh, experienced a lot of success. And my dad eventually, you know, my parents developed a multimillion dollar jewelry business within a matter of about eight years and, you know, big house on the hill, living the American dream, uh, you know, just everything you can imagine. Um, but then in the early 1990s, my, my parents' jewelry business caught on fire uh, and everything burnt down. And we actually ended up losing everything. We went almost completely broke after that point. Um, it was a complete collapse. Um, so we went from having nothing to having everything back down to have everything and having nothing all within a matter of about 12 years. So needless to say, there were 
quite a few ups and downs in my life. Uh, it, was, it was literally like a roller coaster ride. And the roller coaster was about to get more exciting when my dad decided, well, now that we're, you know, at, back at like, you know, starting all over again, he decides to explore new business opportunities and looks to the post-communist countries and specifically Bulgaria because they were just coming out of communism. They didn't have much. So there was a great opportunity. So he decides to explore Bulgaria. We close up everything, leave everything in LA behind for good and move out to post-communist Bulgaria in like 1992, 1993. So there go the roller coaster. It continues. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Uh, this was like a loop, actually. This is what this was the roller coaster loop. <laughs> um, so now, describing Bulgaria in the early '90s and I guess other post-communist countries, you know, no one spoke English. It just wasn't there. Like everything was either in the in the Russian language or the local language was with Bulgarian, and so everything on TV was Russian and Bulgarian. There was no internet. So you can just imagine, <laughs> or it's hard to imagine. There was, uh, you know, there was no basketball courts or volleyball courts or the beach, kind of the things that I grew up doing. And, of course, I had no friends there. I couldn't even talk to anyone. So I went from having everything and a great social life to having absolutely nothing. You can't even watch TV to kill time. So I had a lot of time on my hand, a lot of time to reflect on life and what in the world had just happened to me and how long this phase of my life was going to last. Because it was such a huge move, you know, it's not like you're out of a job and then, you know, maybe three or six months later, you find one. We lost everything and moved to another country where I can't speak to anyone. So I wasn't sure what was going to happen. But that was the time when I was when I had no more external distractions that my inward journey actually began. You know, Um, that's when sort of I started to really ponder the meaning of life and my mindfulness practice in a serious way began in Bulgaria in the early 1990s. Um, and within a couple of years, we, we decided to leave because it wasn't such a safe place uh, for us, at least. Um, and we came back to the U.S., relocated to the East Coast. My parents settled in Jersey. Um, you know, I helped them start another business. But then I decided that, you know, I just didn't want to be on this roller coaster of life any longer. And I wanted to do something else. So Uh, Again, making a very long story very short, I went to a monastery in India just to sort of clear my head, figure out really how to meditate and what I wanted to do in my life and with my life. Thought I'd spent six months living there, you know, where everybody slept slept on the floor, on a hardwood floor, basically. Um, And we're waking up at four in the morning. It's communal living. I'm living with 40 monks. I mean, I wasn't a monk. I was just a guest. And we're waking up at four, meditating from like five to seven o'clock, eight o'clock, like two, three hours a day, serving one another, serving the community. And I just kind of fell in love with this lifestyle of living simply, feeling so deeply content um, that I decided to extend my one month stay to six months, then came back to the U.S. and moved into a monastery in New York City. I thought I'd spend maybe a few months and then, you know, go out and get a job and live life the way everyone else does. But ended up being 15 years of my life that I spent living as a monk until 2014. And, uh, you know, and during that time, I was doing a lot of speaking and lecturing and teaching on university campuses around the country, but specifically at Columbia University, NYU, and other local colleges. And then at the end of those 15 years, I just, or, you know, closer to the end, about 14 years into it, I started feeling the need for more like steady companionship, felt like wanting to get married and, you know, doing, having a transition in my life. And so basically that was the reason that I left the monastic life is I wanted to get married and also see if I could take the messages of mindfulness and mindful leadership uh, into the workplace environment, into corporations and conferences. And so that's my entire life story in about five minutes, I guess. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, Fantastic. Go ahead. So I guess the question that, I, that I've got, I've, obviously, um, there's a lot of people struggling uh, what they're going to do when they grow up. Um, and that includes a lot of baby boomers who are about to retire, which are a lot of my peers that aren't quite ready to stop working. 
Um, but they're, they're realized they're, you know, they, they need to do something different. Uh, you have a lot of, uh, the, the younger generation that is looking for more purpose in their life, but we still live in an economy that is pretty tied, you know, still a capitalistic society. Um, and not everybody has that opportunity, whether they chose it or not to, um, you know, I, I guess stop work and, and go to India for a few months or a few years or live in a monastery and clear their heads and, and come back. So you you chose the path to share what you've learned through your life's journey uh, with others. And I, I think it's coming at a critical time. Uh, one of the other quotes I forgot to mention that I not forgot, but I didn't mention um, was uh, last week, Elon Musk and, uh, you know, shared that AI can make many of our jobs pointless, which is sort of that dystopian, you know, in some ways dystopian uh, view. Uh, how, how did you, or how do you, kind of relate how do you uh, what's your what's the acceptance been within corporate america um to your message which is sort of an idyllic world it's almost going back to when i grew up in you know the late 60s and 70s um when you know the hippies <laughs> almost had the vision mm -hmm. of what you were talking about uh and uh, you know when john lennon went uh, <laughs> you know went to india um, <laughs> yeah. so, 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 so this all, so it was there and then it sort of like faded away, went away and go, well, that doesn't work. You know, everybody grew up and got out of that mood. What's, you know, a lot of questions here. What's different this time? What's your reception? How are you making, you know, how, what are you seeing making a difference? Well, I see that people are incredibly receptive because as you mentioned, a few bullet points that, you know, like leaders and we, we need to inspire, support and encourage one another that's something that's timeless, you know, having positive social connections at work. Yes, we can be competitive, but yet we can still have positive social connections at work. So these are not foreign or outdated ideas. These are ideas that need to be there. And they're, you know, without these ideas, I think things are just going to crumble. The workplaces are, are going to become very, very toxic. If there's just constant ego battles, no one's going to progress. And definitely the organization is not going to progress. So I think these messages, or I have seen that these messages have been very well received because I think deep down inside we know that we just need to be nicer to each other, not just at home or with our friends, but we're working with people and people respond, are receptive to kindness and compassion, much more so than force and aggression because that brings out a different nature from individuals. So, you know, it's really this is something very timeless and it's something that's really, uh, it's a real internal part of who we are. And somehow, you know, unfortunately we have covered it over and made ourselves be believe that we just need to be aggressive and get things done at no matter what the cost is, the cost to our health, our relationship, uh, emotional, physical, mental health, and our relationships. All we need to do is get ahead, succeed, but we're seeing that that's not working. You know, or whether it's in our personal life, whether it's in our workplace, that attitude is just not working. We're getting sicker and we're just kind of like losing motivation. Who can survive in a toxic environment? And, you know, like there's, there's this nice article in the Harvard Business Review that said that positive social connections at work really do amazing things. It basically, people get sick less often if you have positive social mm -hmm. connections at work. That, that means that you just have a better immune system. So happiness and that kind of satisfaction improves your immune system. It prevents you from getting sick as, as much as we do. We have, you know, we can work, we can learn faster, remember longer, uh, you know, and we, we're better on the job. So the, this is research is showing, and why is there even a need to show this research uh, so that help people understand that, yes, being nice to each other, supporting one another in the workplace, that means celebrating when your colleague succeeds or when your colleague gets the promotion, even though you were hoping for it and it didn't happen to you, fine, okay. You can be bitter or you can go congratulate that person. There's only two options that you have in that moment, be bitter or congratulate. If you congratulate, you can now develop a positive social connection with that person. That person probably knows you were hoping for it, but appreciates that you still, you know, mustered up the courage and strength to come up and say that. And the next time you need some support, they're more likely to be there to support you. 
It's just kind of how human beings work. We're just getting back to our essential nature. We respond to kindness with kindness. We respond to aggression with aggression. So this is, I don't think these are, you know, this has always been a part of us, maybe forgotten to some degree, but I'm just hoping that we can realize that we could all be, it's amazing because we can be healthier, happier, and more successful simply if we sort of uh, understand that mindful behavior, mindful attitude, mindful mindsets uh, can lead to all of this. And, and being fine, mindful, we're coming up uh, just uh, about the time of our break. Uh, you're listening to the Geek Skeezers and Googleization Show. Uh, our guest today is Pandi Dasa. Uh, we're talking about mindfulness and what a what a timely subject. Uh, it's in advance of uh, the, the Workforce 2030 Summit. And uh, really excited to, to talk, uh, to come back in just a few minutes and, and hear about um, you know, how is how does this play into the vision of uh, uh, Workforce 2030? And, you know, many of us feel like we're on this loop, uh, uh, Pam, that you, you mentioned. Uh, we're on this loop, not only a roller coaster of ups and downs, but it just keeps repeating itself. So how do we break this cycle? And, and that's what we're going to get to as soon as we come back. Uh, as we always do, we talk about emerging trends and what what their impact will be on our economy, our jobs, and our future. We're going to take a short break. Hear from our sponsors, Jobvite and Success Performance Solutions. Stay right where you are. We will be back in two minutes. Behind everything you're searching for is something you're actually looking for. When you search with the real yellow pages, you get more than a contractor. You get a whole new curb appeal. It's not just getting directions to a dry cleaner with YP.com. It's rescuing an old favorite from the back of the closet. And it's more than finding a locksmith with YP.com on your mobile. It's getting to sleep in your own bed. Whatever it might be, there are more ways to search and more ways to find exactly what you're looking for with the real yellow pages, YP.com, and YP.com on your mobile, only from AT&T. What's up, everyone? This is Keith from the Geek, Skeezers, and Googleization show powered by Jobvite. Jobvite knows career paths are made by people, not by open job requisitions. Jobvite's platform ties recruitment marketing directly to applicant tracking and onboarding, creating continuous candidate engagement that effectively connects recruiters with qualified passive candidates. Used by over 50,000 recruiters placing over 1 million jobs, Jobvite's platform impacts every company in every industry. Check us out at jobvite.com. Listen carefully. Up to 9 out of 10 job candidates visiting your company career page leave before completing an application. You heard that right. 90% of candidates who want to apply for a job at your company don't. That's just plain crazy, especially in today's tight labor market. Candidate experience matters. Stop turning candidates away. Let Success Performance Solutions help. Call us at 800 800- 803-4303 or register at successperformancesolutions.com slash W4CY. Schedule a no obligation consultation and get special access to insider tips to recruit faster and hire smarter. Welcome back, everyone, to the Geek Skeezers and Googleization Show. I'm your host, Ira Wolf. I'm here with Keith Campagna, my co-host, and our special guest today is Pandit Dasa, who will be one of the keynote speakers next week at Workforce 2030 at the Sherm Lehi Valley uh, Summit. I'll be joining him on the stage. We also have uh, Val Grubb and Rob Croner. Rob's from C- CCI Consulting, uh, and Val has uh, Val Grubb Associates. Uh, we'll be talking about the generations and artificial intelligence and what our workforce is going to look like in 2030. Uh, but our guest today, as I said, is Pandit, and right before the break, uh, we heard about the journey um, and, uh, you know, kind of leading up to that, how that's going to how HR can get involved, uh, how they can break the loop. And, and I think you had a question, uh, Keith, right during our break. So I'll, I'll let you ask that and we can lead into uh, into uh, the second half of the show. Yeah, thanks, Ira. You, you know, this I'm obviously for those for Pandy, you don't I don't know how often you get to listen to the show, but this is kind of my lane here in terms of of organizational change. 
and uh, and having to do with the way that people develop, not necessarily the the organization. And one of the interesting components that we deal with all the time coming from a agent of change perspective is that most people don't like to change. And so my curiosity is how, what have you seen? What have you learned over these years? Uh, you obviously grew up in an environment where change was, it seems like it was embraced. And you, you've, you know, and as far as I could tell, you've come out of uh, the monastery uh, fearless with the idea that you can make change the way you want it and, and impact in a positive way. How is it that you see uh, the people that you meet with and the companies that you talk to, how are they receiving this idea and and how are they making change? So, you know, change is something, you know, one thing, I don't know if I came out of the monastery fearless. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't want to sound like some Superman or something uh, because even the transition out was a little scary for me. I knew this was a major change. It was a little scary because 15 years I'm, I was, I was very engaged with the society, but still, I hadn't worked out there. I wasn't sure exactly what I was going to do, which direction it was going to go in. So change is always uncertain, but I'd already experienced so much change, and I had a certain faith that this next change, even though it's also difficult, and it's, there's a lot of uncertainty, as with almost any change that's, that you don't really choose, things that especially just happen in your life, which is kind of how my life's been, things have been happening. But I, I just knew that somehow or other, things would work out, and that... I'm going to do the best I can to always just do the right thing and that I want to make sure that whatever I do is not going to hurt others, you know, uh, and, or be detrimental to my own self or to anyone else. So I knew that whatever changes I'm going to experience, that I'm going to make sure that I transition in the most positive way possible and then just see what life has in store for me because I really didn't expect to be a motivational speaker coming out of the monastic life, even though I'd already done about a thousand speeches while in the monastery, <laughs> I didn't know that there was a, such, a, such a field out there. So change is something, you know, I've had to deal with. And I think my own just journey <clears throat> inward, the mindfulness journey, my own spiritual journey has helped me deal with change in a very positive way. There's always uncertainty and difficulty in the moment, but I've always tried to keep the perspective that even though this change is taking place, there's something I'm going to learn from it, and there's a lot of things that are going to help me grow from this change. And that's sort of what I encourage people in an organization is that you know, mindfulness can actually help us deal with change in that you know, change is always going to be happening in an organization. We have two, ch two choices in that situation. Management's changing, technology's changing, the systems are changing. We can either fight that change, oftentimes to no avail, just causing ourselves more stress and anxiety and causing others more grief because we're fighting it, or realize that this has actually changed and there's not much I can do about it. So let me go ahead and remain flexible and go along with this change and that make it easier for myself and for everyone else because if I can be flexible right now, I'm setting myself up to really learn a whole lot and keep that sort of change muscle that's inside of us flexible and not let it become stiff, right? So this way, we kind of remain flexible to change. And I think mindfulness can really help us because, you know, we're going inward and you start, when you do mindfulness practices, you start realizing that there's so many changes. But if you look back at the changes that have taken place in our life, the transitions that have taken place in our life, we'll see that almost every one of them helped us grow and improve and become stronger. Like, you know, like Steve Jobs said, said something once that you can only connect the dots looking back. You can't connect them looking forward. So we need to be able to look back and realize and look at the things that have happened to us in the past, even if they were very difficult and painful and challenging, look at them in a, with a positive lens and take inventory as to, what are some of the lessons that I learned from that previous change or difficult situation and difficult moment? How did that strengthen me? How did I grow from that? And how is what happened back then helping me with what I'm doing now? So if we can keep that perspective, then when the next change, when we're face to face with the next change or transition, we can play out the same formula that this change is going to strengthen me. I'm going to learn a lot of lessons. I don't know what they are now. Well, I will only know that when I've gotten that to that point and then I can look back. It'll help me grow. It'll help me become stronger. And this way, 
change can allow us to maintain a positive perspective as opposed to being all fearful and negative and discouraged and bitter, because that's an easy route to take as well. So, and so go ahead. Go ahead. Go. So, Pandit, we, we introduced the show in, in, in the beginning, and we talked about, you know, in the next three years, there may be 11 and a half million workers that, um, you know, have to be reskilled and retrained. And, you know, certainly we've heard, you, you're probably aware of the stats that, you know, say up to 50 percent of all our jobs will be eliminated. And, and you know, that's probably a, a pretty drastic uh, uh, dystopian view. But uh, we have a lot of people um, listening to the show, and there's a lot of people out there. Uh, that there will be some dramatic changes over the next few years. And, you know, uh, you know, certainly we've talked about meditation. You've talked about, you know, taking time off. Uh, they don't, many of these people don't have the luxury for that. So what are, what are some of the things, the steps that, that you know, the everyday person, um, you know, somebody who, who goes to work, they work hard, uh, they're struggling to put food on the table, make ends meet, and they're hearing all these things. What are some of the things that they can do to become more mindful and to, uh, again, not avoid change, but um, become more, em embrace it, become more, um, uh, kind of have a more positive outlook? What, what are some of the things that they can do uh, to start now? Well, one very important thing we can do to change our mindset is especially if we're, you know, our mind has this uh, really crazy tendency to remember all the negative things that have happened to us. Mm -hmm. And when it's not remembering the negative things that have happened to us, it's fearing the future or worrying about the future. And so I think to stop the mind, first of all, from doing that, or whenever the mind, we catch ourselves doing that, I think we need to stop in that moment and say, you know what, let me take a look at three positive things that are happening in my life right now. So this is preventing the mind now. You're stopping that vehicle from going in the reverse, where the mind's like, oh, my God, I wish I could have gotten that raise, or I wish I would have taken that other job, or I wish I would have married that other person instead. You know, or what about tomorrow? Or what about five years from now? Okay, I can't control the past or the future, but I can take a moment right now to shift my mindset. And this is something anyone can do at any time, is think of three things you're grateful for right now. You could be simply grateful for the fact that you have, you know, a roof over your head. Something simple. How many people don't have that? And I really do. I do this thing myself. And I'm like, well, I'm grateful to be doing what kind of work I'm doing. I'm grateful to have my family in my life. You know, I'm, just the simple things that we forget about, we need to remind ourselves on a regular basis. And I think also it's really, so this is an added, uh, you know, a meditation on gratitude. Maybe something we can do every single day. And just go ahead and every single day, write down three things you're grateful for. And you'll be amazed at the end of the month how many things you've written out you're grateful for. And you'll be surprised that you'll start coming up with new things that you're grateful for that you didn't even think about. Right now you might be like, well, I can't think of, I can't do three things every day. We could do 30 things every day if we wanted to. So that's one thing. And I think also it's really important that we do take time out. Um, you know, like we said that people don't have the luxury to take some time I think, you know, if we really want to do something, we can, and maybe we can't completely take a break from work, but we can, I think, insert simple practices um, of mindfulness meditation, like just taking three minutes a day, like just three minutes a day, and taking maybe like 10 deep breaths, and trying in that moment to not really think of anything other than just your breath, because our mind is a cluttered place, and when you have a traffic jam in your mind, just like on a traffic jam on a highway, you can't make any progress, you're stuck. So we need to clear the traffic jam in our mind because our mind has between one to 2,000 thoughts every single hour. It's between 25 to 50,000 thoughts per day, an average person, that's how many thoughts an average person has. That's a very busy place. We need to clear that. We need to clear that traffic jam, otherwise we're just gonna be stuck where we are. So we can do that by taking maybe like finding the morning or afternoon or evening or all three, just take 10 deep breaths and really just breathe out all the tension, anxiety, and all the unnecessary thoughts that are going through our head, giving our mind a little break. I like to think of it as like closing the apps in your mind or closing the apps on your smart device. It makes your smart device work better. Same thing with our mind. If we close out the apps on our mind, our mind will work better. It'll be more clear. And then we may even get clarity on some of the difficult situations of our life. Whereas it's, if we just keep going, incredible. keep going, keep going. You know, it's just not going to happen. It's incredible. And that's, yeah, right. and, and I think how more contagious 
that is inside of an organization as compared to uh, a mandatory training that comes in from somebody down the hall or from some email, right? This idea of collaborative uh, creativity. I saw a statistic recently where um, 90%, and I think it was, it might've been a Deloitte one. It might've been, I don't know, maybe in Sperity. I'm not sure, but it was a legit, it was a legit report. And it said that 90% of the respondents felt their coworkers were unhappy. Wow. And the idea that's of, incredible. of it is, it is. And, and to think, you know, it's funny, you know, I, I, I have a, a little Buddha um, water element here <laughs> in my backyard. And uh-huh. I love that there's smiles there, right? Because to me, the joke's up. All you have to do is just breathe, be grateful and and share that, you know, and, and it's become I, I mean, I'm looking forward to the great battle between humans and technology inside of organizations, because I I really feel like there's a you know, in spite of, you know, there is a reality coming from Elon and 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 what AI is potentially capable of doing. But uh, I think it's about time we start talking about what humans are potentially capable of doing. Yeah. And, you know, one other thing is that just imagine this, what I just talked about, like, let's say in the morning you're about to go into work, you know, just rushing into work. Why not maybe take two or three minutes and just take 10 deep breaths Take a moment to appreciate some of your colleagues before entering that workplace. You know, while you're in your car or if you take public transportation to work, just take a moment to take 10 deep breaths. Like, okay, I'm going into the workplace and let me appreciate three of my colleagues and just in my mind. Yeah, this person does this and this person's been so, you know, so positive. And now walk into your workplace with that mindset or start a meeting like that. (laughs) Start a meeting by thinking some positive thoughts about each other because that's not always the case. You know, there's people that we don't get along with or see eye to eye with, and it's hard for us to hear them. So why not shift our mindset and attitude before even starting that? Or the same thing when you leave work and before you enter your home, take a few minutes, decompress, let things go if you can from whatever happened at work. Walk around the block, take 10 deep breaths, because so now you can get back to your home and really give yourself to your spouse and your family. Like preparing ourselves for the next thing. We Absolutely. don't prepare ourselves for the next thing. We just go from thing to thing to thing. We carry one baggage from one thing to the other to the other. We need to let go of that baggage before we enter the next thing. And that's a huge component of mindfulness in our daily life. Man, yes. I, I want to be sensitive to uh, your time. I know you have a, a stop uh, in just a few minutes, so we want to make sure that you have time to kind of share how people can get in touch with you. So we want to be able to do that and then um, kind of also get some final comments from you of, of what, you know, w- what is it about the Workforce 2030 that, that got, has you most excited um, and, you know, where, where are we headed? So if you want to uh, kind of close with, uh, how people can get in touch with you, where they can learn a little bit more about you uh, and uh, and mindfulness and also a kind of final comment on uh, your vision for Workforce 2030. Well, you know, I was reading um, one article uh, from Great Places to Work that has, and one of the things that for the workplace of 2030, that people are going to want to make sure that their work is more joyous and more fulfilling, mm-hmm. Right. That, that happiness is as important as financial success for a lot of the youth. And so for me, that's exciting. Not just the technology aspect, but that people are thinking there's a mindset shift taking place where people are realizing they need happiness as much as financial success because you can have the money and be depressed. <laughs> right? yeah, there's a lot of that, so, for sure. There's a lot of that. And so I'm so thrilled that that's what I'm looking forward to seeing a shift in mindsets where people are coming to this realization that yet yeah, we need work to be joyous and more fulfilling and we need happiness in the workplace. Cause when people realize that and demand it, workplaces are going to have to make a certain changes to provide that kind of environment for their workforce. Otherwise it's not going to be sustainable. No, absolutely. 100%. So, so how Thank can, you. you know, how you, you obviously have experienced an amazing journey uh, and hopefully have gotten a few people, uh, a few of our listeners started on that, but how can they learn more? What, what, what can they do to learn more from you or more about mindfulness? 
So uh, my website is a great place to start. I have some articles on there on mindfulness in the workplace. I have some motivational videos that one can just watch just for a little, quick little motivation. My website is my name, PanditDasa.com. That's P-A-N-D-I-T-D-A-S-A, PanditDasa.com. I'm also very accessible on LinkedIn. Again, just Pandit Dasa. So I think that's a great place to start and connect. I've got all kinds of workshops that I've offered in companies across the country at conferences that you can see there. Got some sample videos of my speeches. And, uh, yeah, just everything you kind of need to know about me and what I do is there. And then it's a great place for us to start off connecting. And then I'm happy to be a resource for anybody who wants to reach out to me and connect. And, you know, of course, I look forward to meeting you both at the conference next week. I'm super excited about that. No, absolutely. Uh, very excited. I appreciate you taking some time to, to be part of this and uh, we'll be able to get the message out and hopefully uh, promote the event a little bit. But if not, this will be uh, this will be evergreen, uh, be up on uh, the podcast. And hopefully, uh, again, this will be in a journey and I'm sure uh, we'll be crossing paths quite a bit over uh, uh, the time between uh, 2019 and 2030. So absolutely. I hope so. so. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, 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 it should be fun. In. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. And we'll see you next week. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you. Okay. Be well. Oh, that was thank awesome. Bye -bye. That was so <laughs> fantastic. Yeah. So, yeah, no, Keith, you, you, uh, I, I, I can imagine you'd be jumping out of your seat here. I have to kind of strap you into the chair. It almost, <laughs> if, since we're coming up towards the end of the show, it almost feels like the perfect time for me to mention that I'm going to be keynoting the Greater Valley Forge SHRM event next Tuesday. And you can go to um, my LinkedIn profile. And I've posted a couple spots throughout LinkedIn universe in terms of the registration link. Uh, and I'm going to be talking a whole, about, a whole lot about this, about the stuff that I've learned on the podcast, the stuff that I learned from being a software sales rep for a decade and a half. And, uh, and it's going to be, I, I mean, I wish I was walking onto the stage right now. I really do. <laughs> yeah, there, there are so many things that um, kind of going on, uh, you know, with, again, talking about Workforce 2030, I think that's a theme that's, uh, you know, pretty generic. Uh, but, you know, how to masterminding success in your organization. Uh, just kind of reminder, uh, you know, we just heard from uh, Pandit. Uh, and uh, so that, that's going to be extraordinary. Uh, you know, part of that reminded me of my talk for uh, the TED Talk. You know, we talked about VUCA, and that's that's really part of my message next week um, about, you know, we live, we, you know, how do we thrive in a complex world? So living in a world of VUCA, uh, volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous. Uh, but there's then there's the VUCA prime. And, you know, we, we talk about, uh, you know, having a vision and understanding and being more have, having better communication, being more agile. But ultimately, it's it's about kind of that life of abundance that how do we leverage technology uh, to put the human back or put or keep the human in HR, um, but also how do we start to enjoy life again? How do we uh, not have these 80 hour work weeks and, and these crazy times, or at least if we're working 80 hours that we enjoy doing it <laughs> like some or, of us or, do. Or C, right? Let's, let's integrate life and work and let's work 50, but let's be so damn good at it because we're not burdened by stress yeah. and we're not worried about the past where we move towards that, fearless kind of frictionless uh lifestyle versus worrying about stuff which obviously slows us down look at america yeah, right for sure so you know again the other speakers that are going to be available next week uh for those who can make it and uh for those who you know for for the speakers who weren't able to uh, coordinate schedule we couldn't coordinate our schedules with them um because they are traveling and they are busy uh you know hopefully we'll have them on the show one yeah. of these days uh if not we'll have them on the linkedin live and uh we'll be doing that uh so we've got val grubb uh her topic is going to be workforce 2030 are you ready uh as i mentioned i'm going to be talking about the future of work thriving in a complex world we we just heard from pandit uh dasa uh mindful leadership uh powerful powerful message uh, and uh, we and Rob Croner from CCI Consulting uh, will be talking about developing successful leadership transitions uh, in this multi generational workforce. Uh, so again, event's going to be September 18th, Steel Stacks, uh, Pencil, uh, Bethlehem, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, next Wednesday. And you can go to shermlv.org. That's s h r m l v.org. 
uh, and just click on events and uh, you can register and uh, hopefully we'll we'll see you there. Um, final, what are, what are some final words from you, Keith? Uh, I, I have a great day. I mean, I just think that for those of you that are out there listening, there are people that are, you know, present company included, right? There are people out there that could help your organization move through this change. And ultimately, you know, as HR leaders, as executives inside of organizations and business owners, you don't have to be afraid. This isn't uncharted territories. This is something that has been reviewed. And there are smart people with compassionate concepts that are there to help and uh, and just reach out to me or Ira uh, and we could connect it to the guests or uh, we could talk to you as well. So, yeah, that's my message. Yeah. And I, I appreciate that, Keith. And uh, again, certainly, uh, we're, we, we've got we've got a great lineup coming up in the fall, and we will be continuing on that. Uh, again, I want to thank uh, Pandit Dasa uh, for being our guest today, um, and Keith for you being the co-host. I want to thank all our listeners. We're always interested in hearing what's on your mind. Let let us know how we're doing. If you're interested in being a guest or a sponsor, just sharing a few thoughts. Uh, don't forget to to call in uh, when we're live, and also to chat or to comment. Uh, we're, we're always on LinkedIn and Twitter and, and a few other social networks. Uh, you can listen to the podcast on uh, basically any podcast platform yeah. that's out there. Uh, you can tune in every Wednesday, 1 p.m. Eastern time, W4CY.com, or uh, just connect with us on LinkedIn and Twitter. And Keith. one last thing, Ira, special thanks to the new sponsors coming on board. Anyone interested in sponsoring the show, come on. We've got a couple spots left. We're getting, uh, it's been a wild ride. People are jumping at the opportunity. We've got the stats, we've got the data. So if you want to be a sponsor, uh, let us know. Yeah. Again, reach out yeah, to we'll, LinkedIn. Yeah, we'll be introducing them over the next few weeks and uh, very grateful to them. Uh, and again, for JobVite uh, and Success Performance Solution for uh, helping us out through the last uh, 11 months. Crazy, isn't it? Uh, yeah. So until the next episode of Geek Skeezers and Googleization, this is Ira Wolf and Keith Compagna. Don't let the shift hit your plans.